on Tuesday morning, Al brought his dog and I brought my dog to our early morning walk. And so when we arrived and we opened our car doors, there was a lot of barking and there was a lot of pulling on the leash. Yet as the dogs drew closer and closer to each other, they calmed down a bit and they started to do that doggy handshake, you know, the one that involves a lot of sniffing. <coughs> They were still unsure, and they were still a little nervous around each other, but our team of walkers that morning had places to go and flyers to deliver, and so we just set off, exercising our hearts and legs, and the dogs fell in beside us, just glad to be part of the pack. And by the time we returned to the church, the dogs were friends, and they were calm, and they, they were on good terms with each other. I've had this experience over and over again, that when I'm out walking with my dog and the dog meets another that is not known, he's, she's very excited and there's a lot of positioning, posturing as they decide who's going to be the boss, but given a chance to walk with each other or work with each other, they calm right down. They are both calmer and quieter the next time they meet. I think human relationships work like this too. When we are a little bit wary of people we don't know until we get into a conversation with them. And we develop some acceptance and understanding with each other. Our inborn protective instincts make us wary of strangers. So each time that a stranger starts to approach you, you start to categorize that person depending on a list of things. Like, for example, what circumstances are you meeting this person under? Is it in the middle of a road, on a dark night, or is it Sunday school? What are the physical characteristics of this person? Are they bigger than you, or smaller, older, or younger, of your same social clique, or your same race? And what happened <coughs> last time when you met someone? When you met someone new, was it a good experience or did it not turn out well and so that you're kind of hesitant to meet the next new person? We tend to be more accepting of those in our own tribe and more wary of those that we deem outsiders. Jesus got caught in that trap too. Many of us just don't like to see Jesus' human foibles. Well, you know, we're kind of comfortable with the fact that Jesus could be tired after preaching all day, or we're comfortable with the fact that he could be angry at the corruption in the church, or we're even cool when, when we've decided that he's responding in sadness because John the Baptist has died. But today we've caught Jesus with his compassion down, as my professor Sharon Ringy would say. Let's just do a quick recap of the past few Sundays so that we can all start on the same page. Jesus has learned that John the Baptist has died. And yet, he spent some time grieving, but he's also had to minister to all the other crowds that gathered. The other people who had heard the news and came for healing. And he has fed them as well. He's just had this big discussion with the Pharisees about ritual cleanliness, saying it's not the rituals or the, or the rites that we do, but it's the condition of our hearts and the purity of our words. Do our words hurt others? And now he's left the area of the Galilee, and he's gone to Tyre and Sidon on the coast of the Mediterranean. He's <coughs> left the area that is predominantly the children of Israel, and he's gone to an area that is predominantly Gentile. He's left his workplace to go to a place where maybe he's not known, to get away from the ministry. It's like he's gone to the ocean city of the Mediterranean. But then this Canaanite woman, she begins to shout and call for his atten attention. This Canaanite, this woman, is shouting, this is not right. And, and she just, she keeps at it. And, and he, he, he doesn't know what to do. And he turns.
turns to the disciples and he says, this woman's not part of my ministry. I have been sent to heal the children of Israel. But she's persistent and she softens her approach. She knows the words to use, even though he's gone to a land where no one should know him. And she says, Lord. That shows that she respects his power and authority. She calls him son of David. How did she know those religious messianic words? She asks him to heal her daughter. How did she know he could heal? And she softens her approach and she says, Lord, have mercy on me. She reaches out for Jesus' compassion. But he responds with his tribalism in full force. Woman, it's not fair to give the food of the children to the dogs. Oh my gosh, that word that we translate as dogs in Greek actually carries the meaning of little worthless dog. It's a derogatory term. Jesus was caught with his compassion down. She's clever. She's bold. And she speaks with the voice of God when she replies, Lord, even the dogs eat the crumbs from under the master's table. It's an aha moment for Jesus. From that point on, his ministry changes to become more and more inclusive. Until at the end of chapter 28, Jesus says, Go and make disciples of all nations. To the Canaanite woman, who was originally beyond his realm, he says, Woman, your faith is great. What you ask shall be done and her child is immediately healed. Who, in today's modern times, are the Canaanites that we would leave out? Who does God have to show us belongs in our ministry? Our economy's been kind of stressed lately. And when that happens and resources become scarce, we tend to draw the circle smaller. We tend to protect what we already have. So here's a question for you. What about immigrants, the undocumented workers? Are they outside our reach? <coughs> oh, you might ask me in response, well, why don't they just come in the country legally? Well, once they could. Once we had no immigration rules and people came. But in 1882, we made our first boundary, and we started to exclude the Chinese. In, 18, in 1924, we developed quotas, deciding how many people could come in. And so in June of 39, when the SS St. Louis arrived at our shores with 936 Jewish immigrants on board, we turned them away. The leaders could have made an exception, they could have broadened out the quotas, but they sent those 936 six souls back to Germany. And only 365 <coughs> made it through the Holocaust. There once was a time when the borders were more fluid, when people would come to work for a season and then return back to their homelands. But in 1965, Lyndon Johnson closed the border. What, what, what's happened is we constrict these rules. We constrict them and constrict them and constrict them. And so what's happened is over time there's way more immigrants trying to get in the country than will ever be accepted. And there's people living in desperate situations in other countries <laughs> who would work hard at any job, even jobs that Americans don't really want to do. Let me just give you one final statistics to kind of clarify this situation. In 1910, 20,000 low-skilled workers were allowed into the country every week. Wow. Yeah, wow. In 2010, <coughs> only 10,000 low-skilled workers are let in in a whole year. 
Um, that's how we ended up with over 10 million undocumented workers in the U.S. And I would suggest that if we could hear their personal stories, if we could spend half a day with them, we would be re ready to rip off that label and just accept them as a child of God. Who else triggers our tribalism? How about Muslims? Well, I'm not suggesting that Muslims are going to join us for worship, because they're not. They have their own worship. But they're also very mission-driven. So you're probably going to meet them when you're looking after the homeless. Or you're going to meet them when you're stacking cans onto the shelves of a food bank. Or you're going to meet them when you're out walking for crop, because they would also want to alleviate the famine in Africa. So could we invite them to participate in any of our community events? What about the 1,460 same-sex couples living in Anne Arundel County? Would we welcome them here? Would you encourage me to baptize their children? Would you willingly share communion with them? The Baltimore Sun shared the story of Catherine and Sue this week, who reminded us that they have the same family concerns as you do, like driving their kids to events, buying groceries, especially milk, and protecting their children. The challenging question is to us, who are the Canaanites to us? Who are we tempted to leave out? And who is God going to show us belongs in our ministry? I have a confession. On Tuesday, when we went out to the parks to do ministry <coughs> and to talk and walk with people, I had a mental image of what those families would look like. And the first family that approached us did not fit that image at all. And it was like, aha, God just broke through my boundaries again. Of course this family needs to exercise. Of course this family wants to have fun in the park. That's why they're there. And I shot up a quick prayer to God and I said, thank you for showing me that your arms are big enough to embrace all. American poet Edwin Markham wrote the following about the human tendency to exclude others. He wrote, he drew a circle that shut me out, heretic, rebel, a thing to flout. But love and I had the wit to win. We drew a circle that took him in. My husband, Frank, says that our little dog, Daisy, has a mean bark. Right, Beth? Beth lives next door. She has a mean bark. And she barks menacingly at lovely Beth. <laughs> but she also barks really menacingly when she's obsessively guarding our backyard. Bouncing basketballs are particularly evil and must be defended against at all cost. I'm sure that strangers passing by our corner would think that there was a pit bull or a rottweiler or a German shepherd or a bull mastiff or some kind of mongrel on the other side of the fence, not a little black pit bull that's actually really quite submissive and very gentle with children. That fence, it blocks her from interpreting the situation on the other side. And so what is ever on the other side of that fence remains evil until they have a chance to come through our gate. Barriers between humans are broken when we begin to see all people as God's children. Salvation is open to everyone, and thanks goodness, because if there were limits on that, maybe we would be excluded too. I challenge you this week to walk and talk with someone that you don't know. Share your stories together so that you can share your ministries. Amen.